Okay, I think we have it working. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Troy Swanson. I'm the library department chair. Thank you for those of us, those of you attending um, live, and then also welcome to everybody out in the world watching the recording <laughs> later on. Um, this program is part of our One Book, One College series on the book All We Can Save, which focuses on how we build sustainable communities. Um, I am very excited to welcome Jana Sveck, who's a faculty member in our Earth Science area and is also the director of our Nature Study area. Um, it's, uh, you know, she's done a lot of work preserving um, our natural habitat for Illinois and really locally here on campus. So um, it, we thought it'd be a good opportunity for Yana to share that work and to help us understand, um, you know, a little bit more about our local environment. So Yana, thank you so much for your time and I will turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen right now, my PowerPoint, which are consist mainly of photos. <laughs> Here we go. So what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, again, introduction. Thank you, Troy. My name is Jana Smek, and I am currently the director of the nature study area. I say currently director because um, I'm just a steward right now at this time, uh, and I wanted to highlight all of the uh, work that has come before me and, and basically give you a little brief history of how the nature study area came to be at Moraine Valley Community College. So with that, I want to dedicate this talk to uh, Richard Finley. And he was a professor of geology at Moraine Valley for, for over 35 years. Uh, and he was my mentor. And he and a team of other uh, professors at that time were really the ones that started the entire nature study area. And so that's what I'm going to be talking a lot about is kind of how it began and all the work that Dick Finley and other environmental science faculty members um, did before us. So, unfortunately, Dick passed away in June 2011, but his legacy goes on, and that's what we're talking about today. So, this is just a photo of Marine Valley, um, a pretty old one. I will come back to this, and I, I'm going to highlight kind of what the view here is. Here's the prairie. Back here is Keene Avenue. This is 107, so at, at that entrance. Uh, so, before so um, this is also a original drawing by uh, his name was Dave Crop, and this is what they uh, envisioned the nature study area was going to look like. This is back in 1974. So it's a little different, but um, pretty much it's this is the gist of it. Uh, here would be our pond where this little class ring is. This is where the actual deck is kind of shifted a little bit. Um, but I'm going to go back first to way back about 400 million years ago, just to talk a little bit about the geology of the area. And again, I mentioned that Dick Finley was a geologist and he uh, originally 400 million years ago, um, most of North America was, this was during the Silurian time period. It was under a shallow sea. And so here is the Great Lakes. Uh, here would be Chicagoland area, and these little blue uh, icons are uh, coral reef deposits. So we have coral reef deposits um, all over Illinois and certainly in our prairie. Now, fast forward a little bit uh, more recent to about 2.8 million years ago now, and we are now in uh, what's called the Pleistocene epoch. And this is a period of extensive ice sheet. So you can see how large most of North America was under about a two mile thick sheet of ice. And this ice sheet, this glaciation period, really shaped our landscape, uh, not only in Illinois, but in much of the United States. And it actually carved out as it retreated, it carved out the Great Lakes. So moving forward again, I know it says 10,000 BC, but it's actually, the dates have changed a little bit. It is about 14,000 BC. Um, we are, here's Blue Island, just to give you a little bit of an idea of our location here at Moraine. Um, 
the, that huge, massive melting sheet of ice that I was showing you, this large ice sheet, as it was melting and retreating, um, at each stage, it would go through a stage where it was um, temp uh, I'm sorry, stationary for a period of time. So maybe a thousand years, 2000 years. And during that time, the glacier is uh, still advancing, meaning the ice is still moving forward in the glacier. And think of a glacier as just a gigantic bulldozer. And as it moves across the landscape, it picks up everything, all the material of the landscape that it, um, that it passed over and so the ice carries a, a lot of debris that is what we call till till is made up of unsort of sediment so it could be huge boulders um, or you know tiny fine sand grains but a big mishmash of debris so when a glacier is stationary it's not advancing or retreating but the ice flow is still moving inside the glacier and so all that material is being pushed to the front of the glacier. It gets deposited in what's called a moraine. And that's where we get our name, Moraine Valley. We're kind of in the valley with um, these beautiful recessional moraines all around us. So you have this moraine and the moraine is basically, an, it, this is an end moraine. It's like a ridge of all of this material called till, as I mentioned. So you get this big, the, they're called moraine hills. So it's a big ridge of all that material that the glacier left behind and it gets dumped. And then what happened about 14,000 years ago, the glacier is continuing to melt back. And as it's melting, it's releasing a huge amount of water. So what we get is that water gets trapped behind these big moraines and it turned into a lake. So uh, Lake Michigan at one time was what we call post glacial Lake Chicago. So if we are in Moraine Valley right now, we would be underwater 14,000 years ago. The water would be lapping up against this moraine. Um, and then fast forward a little bit, maybe a, a thousand years later, uh, all that water gets trapped behind the moraine and it builds up a lot of water pressure. So the water actually broke through two channels, which is now the Des Plaines, Ri Des Plaines River and the Calseg Canal, and it the water level then drops because the water has an outlet. And so this is what the glacier did and the water levels did kind of in three consecutive uh, time periods. And at each event when the water was kind of stationary contained, you had a beach. And so that is what's very unique. Not only do we in our nature study area, is it ecologically unique as a prairie, a tall grass prairie, but it is also uh, geologically unique because you can see these three ancient beach layers that we have. So one is on the Glenwood Beach, which is actually on the Valparaiso Moraine. Then as the water level dropped and each time it dropped about 20 feet, you have the Calumet Beach, and then it dropped to the Tolston Beach, and then the current Lake Michigan Beach is where it is today. You can see the three ridges. This is a very old photo from uh, prior to 1975 of our campus. Here's, here's Keene Avenue here, and this is 107th. This is our nature study area. So this land was set aside, um, 40 acres, and I'll talk about that in, in a minute. Uh, but here you can see the, the ancient beach level. So where our campus is, we are on the uh, Tolston Beach, which is about 20 feet above present day Lake Michigan. And then you can kind of see how it, it rises a little bit. And this, you'll notice there's no pond. It hasn't been dug out yet. This would be the second beach layer, the Calumet Beach layer. And then it's hard to see in this photo, but it continues up. So if you're driving 107th, you'll notice you'll incline slightly. So another 20 feet um, to the Glenwood Beach. And that's where the, the church is on Keene Avenue. So when you drive 107th from our campus, you're actually going up 40 feet by the time you get to LaGrange Road. Uh, so here's also another 
photo of, you can kind of just see how this is a ridge up here. Here's coming from LaGrange Road. This is Keene Avenue heading towards, I'm sorry, this is 107th, but here is the cross section of Keene Avenue and there's the church. So that is also, um, you know, again, geologically important. We see those ancient three beach levels of, of Lake Chicago. And so Dick Finley and his colleagues knew how unique this area was. And so when the college was forming and growing in 1975, they asked the board of trustees to set aside 40 acres of land and they were going to um, do a huge prairie restoration project. So these are this is the what it looked like before. You can see some of the portable buildings that used to be on campus. And so this is what is our nature study area right here. And so it began in the prairie restoration project began in 1975 and it all started again, as I said, with Dick Finley and the other colleagues that he worked with, some of the biology department, some of the geology department, and they pretty much did all of the, the hard work. So here's just some images. They took that 40 acres and piecemealed. They did um, separate projects piece by piece. So this was their kind of first section that they attempted to restore to a tall grass prairie. Now. The, you know, you may think, well, why did they, you know, why didn't they leave it as a forest? Um, like you can see the forest preserve across the street of 107. Why didn't they reconstruct it to become a, a forest? And that's because they wanted to restore it to uh, the native landscape of Illinois, which Illinois prior to settlement was 60% of Illinois was covered in tall grass prairie. Uh, today, we have 0.01% of this tall grass prairie that evolved over thousands of years in this area. So they wanted to turn the nature study area into what the ecosystem was for thousands of years prior to settlement. And in the US, all of the US, only less than 4% of all our tall grass prairies and mixed prairies exist. So that is why they, um, they did this whole prairie restoration project in 1975. So here, just going through some of the stages of how they started this. Uh, so this is plowing in the fall. So they plowed this section and then um, they used, uh, this is disking. So after you plow, you use this kind of steel disc and it cuts up the roots because this was all just an abandoned farmland at one point. So they wanted to make sure they, they tore up all the roots of the existing shrubs that were in this area. And this was done in the spring and it also breaks up debris. And then they were, of course, you have to seed. They didn't have any, there was, there's still some seed bank in the soil, but they also added uh, their own seeds. So these are all pictures in 1975. Um, and so they were, this is seed preparation and then this is sowing of the seeds. So you can see a lot of people came out and helped. Uh, I think this is Herb Mathwig's son, who was also an environmental science professor. And so the, it was just all students, uh, faculty, staff, friends, family, and they all came out and just distributed the seeds. And then they raked it. You can see all the work that's being done by everyone involved. And then this is the uh, fall of 1976. This was sort of their, their results. And here is a photo that shows you the area. This is the, the area that they worked on in 1975. And this is um, just showing you planted versus non-planted. This is kind of what it looked like, just an abandoned farmland. Uh, they also did, so when I say they did all of the work, they also did the burning. And they would um, do this as a group. And the way that they burned, as we do today, they you light a backfire here. So you can see this is a torch. And they're just um, lighting a backfire across the whole perimeter of the segment that they want to burn. And here it is as well. And then eventually, um, 
as the wind kind of takes it, it pushes it all together in the center. And so you can see this is again, this is about 1977, the spring of 1977. And then this is the end result. So they would do this section by section um, and they continued to burn this until about 1996. So this is after the burn, what it looked like. Um, here's some more images after the burn. Um, burning a prairie is essential to prairie restoration because it may look as if you've just wiped out the entire <laughs> landscape, but actually prairie roots are, um, they go down to about almost 12 feet deep. Uh, so what you see above the ground is only about a fraction of what the plant is actually below ground. So when you burn a prairie, you do not destroy the root system. In fact, you add nutrients to the ground and um, it, it kills any, um, uh, you know, dead plants, any diseases, and it just basically gives it an ecological boost. And it's very essential. It kills any shrubs or woody species um, and it allows the, the grasses and the forbs to flourish. So fire maintenance is very essential to prairie management. Um, this is part of the next thing that they tried to establish once they started to see the grasses come back is they wanted to um, put a pond in. And so this is you Sullivan Springs, and I'll show you on some of the other images, but there's a, there are 11 natural springs that run underneath um, Keene Avenue and 107th, and they attempted to do this. This is what Dick Finley, oh, I'm sorry, Dick Finley would always call the, uh, before the chainsaw massacre. <laughs> I'll show you that image as well. And so they started to it was kind of a, a wetland. It was basically a peat bog because those springs existed. So it was a very damp, wet spot in the prairie. And so they begun uh, the construction of the pond, which is basically, again, in a peat bog. So you can see this is a tractor that got stuck. So it was a lot of work and effort to do this. But in 1977, they started to dig out the pond. And the pond is predominantly peat. So that's this um, dark black soil, mate, basically almost soil. And then underneath the water, this gray stuff with almost like a tinge of blue is called glee. And it's really just a sticky layer of clay. And that forms in really waterlogged soils. And they took all of this material and dumped it right across. And that's what's now called the berm. So this is constructing the pond. You can see it kind of coming together now. And the pond was originally um, dug out to about 16 feet deep and about one acre. And again, you can just see this is kind of the perimeter. And then it was naturally filled in. So underneath, this is just showing you the dugout where you see these kind of little lines here. These are where the springs enter underground and that's what filled in the pond. So the pond was filled in naturally. They just dug out the, the base of the pond and the pond was filled out uh, naturally. So here you can see a picture of the pond and filled in by those 11 springs, Sullivan Springs. And then this, the they stocked it in 1978 with uh, 300 largemouth bass and about maybe 3,000 bluegill as the prey fish. And then just let nature take its course. This is uh, sampling in 1978. Um, they were doing depth sampling. They also built the pier, which we've added to and updated. And um, they would do maintain uh, kind of the fish count. So they would, every other year, they would sane the pond and do population samples on the pond. And we're going to fast forward a little bit now to 1990. 
And this is when the nature study area was rededicated. And that was on the 20th anniversary of Earth Day. So there was a rededication ceremony. Again, this was before my time. I came in August of 2000. And this was April 22nd, 1990. They rededicated it. And then here's just some aerial shots. Um, they continued planting. This is after the fourth planting. So you can see the sections that they planted. And here's the pond now. So this is Keene Avenue right here. Here's the Keene Avenue cutoff. And then this is 107th. So very different. <laughs> a little bit different configuration than what we have today. Here's another view of it, um, kind of from the south. Again, this is 107th, and here's Keene Avenue. So here's here's the nature study area. In 1991, they continued with um, this was actually. Um, an EPA project. It was the EPA West, uh, wetland restoration project. And what they wanted to do was clean up. Um, they had some natural oaks on the property that they wanted to clean up. So they called this the, uh, the EPA West uh, wetland restoration cleanup of the oak savanna. Now, an oak savanna is kind of um, where, you know, you've got about 50% oaks and about 50% prairie grasses that grow underneath. Um, we don't a lot. Some of these oaks died, but we do have our 1 iconic, um, burr oak that I'll show you an image of. So these are. This is just, you could see all the shrubs and they cleaned this area up. And as it evolved. As an image, this is all the brush pile and they burn the brush piles. And then this is. What it looks like. In 1992, the next sort of stage of the prairie restoration was um, the Sullivan Springs cleanup. So here, where you saw that chain, this is kind of after the chainsaw massacre that Dick Finley used to always refer to. So uh, the springs are underground. Um, they dug out the pond, as you can see, and then they had uh, about 15 to 18 willows that they actually took out and removed. And so you can see the progress here. So they had to remove all of those, get rid of that. And then they built the um, Jack Bradley observation deck. This was in 1992. So they dedicated this to a former colleague, Jack Bradley. And this is basically, um, an outdoor classroom environment, a teaching classroom that we still use today. We've done a little bit of updating on it, uh, but this is uh, this was done in 1992. This is 1996, I believe. These photos are from 1996, and this is the last burn that they did until 2008. And I just wanted to show you some of these images. Um, there's a lot of cattails, which we're still uh, fight today. And again, lighting the backfire and here's Dick Finley and lots of volunteers. It's Dick Finley and her math wig. I'm sorry, Jim rule. I apologize. Also in the environmental science department. This is a photo of Jim rule. There's Dick Finley. And, um, other volunteers from campus up. And here as well, so this is, uh, the, that iconic burr oak that we still have today. And you can just see how, you know, from the original photos in 1975, how much the prairie has evolved. These are all, um, tall grasses and I'll go through some of the grasses in a bit. And just looking at some of the burn photos they took that day. And this would have been in the spring of 1996. So they, the, the burning stopped in 1996 and it didn't reconvene until 2008. Uh, but in 2001, and I started in 2002, we had another rededication ceremony and this was for the 25th anniversary of the nature study area. And this is Dick Finley here and he is, um, we invited, 
a steward called Ray Schulenberg, and he was a curator of native plants at the Morton Arboretum from 1955 until 1987. He was an expert in prairie restoration. He worked under Floyd Swink, who wrote the uh, plants of the Chicago region, who was also a prairie ecologist. And so we invited Ray Schulenberg and a colleague of his, Mary, to come and um, experience our prairie and to also do an inventory of our plants. And so he came and um, I was there, Dick was there, and this is Ray Schulenberg. And Ray died in 2003, but we were lucky, this was 2001, we were lucky that we had him come and um, talk to us and do a plant inventory. And he also took a look at our pond and did some inventories there. And so we did another rededication April 24th, 2001. Um, this is, I wanted to talk a little bit about the pond because when I came in 2000, Dick was very excited that I was, I was a, um, uh, fisheries ecology major was my background. And so I studied large and smallmouth bass in Eastern Ontario. And so he was very excited to have me swim the pond. <laughs> so in 2001, I came and started to do an inventory of the pond. So this is what it looks like in 2001, you can see uh, it's changed quite significantly. This is the new dock, but this is how much larger it has gotten. So this darker region is was the original pond that was dug out to an acre. It's a little over two acres now um, because those springs still exist and it continuously feeds the pond. And this side, this kind of Eastern side of the pond is now um, really just a great um, wetland habitat. So today the pond, as I mentioned earlier, it was dug out at a depth of about 16 feet. Um, today it's filled in significantly with sediment that the springs bring, and it is probably about maybe 10 feet deep at the very deepest section in the middle of this area, um, and maybe only a foot deep in this part. And even now it's probably that's filled in significantly. This was 20 years ago. Um, I used to swim it for about five years and then it got too difficult to swim. But what I did was um, I started to do a little bit of inventory of the largemouth bass. And so this is just a, sh a photo of largemouth and smallmouth bass and just the, the difference between them. Smallmouth are a little bit more Northern. They need a rockier substrate kind of, um, they can't live in murky waters. Largemouth bass do great in that kind of habitat. Um, and the difference between them, their coloration and also the size of their um basically how their mouths whether they so with the largemouth bass the mouth the end of the mouth extends beyond the eyes here but not with the smallmouth bass so that's a big difference and then you can largemouth bass has a horizontal stripe um and the smallmouth bass have vertical stripes so what I did uh, was I swam the pond and I looked for nest sites and it's the males that do the nesting and they're solitary nest builders. So like bluegill, for example, nest in colonies, but bass are solitary nesters and they will actually carve out an area and a nest and then they will wait for a female. Here you can see that this is actually um, smallmouth bass. Um, I didn't get great images at the day I was swimming the pond, but you can see uh, this is spawning, which is all external fertilization, and um, the female will get a little bit more heavily barred and colored. And then this is a male with uh, his fry. So they go through various stages. First, you have the eggs, and then egg sac fry and then free swimming fry or fry swimming above the nest and then free swimming fry. And so the males will guard their nest for about four to six weeks. 
until they are reach basically independence at that point. So I also laid these little nest tags down just to keep track for a few years of where the nests were and how they were doing. Um, this is just a photo swimming, but um, here is our pond and I had a little map, uh, a slate of our pond where I would record the nests. So I did an inventory for about five years, but then it got a little bit too um, shallow to swim. So then I did inventory from um, uh, the canoe because you could easily spot the nests from from the canoe. We also had some nest boxes that were built. Uh, these are wood duck nest boxes. So I cleaned those out that day in this photo. And um, the nest boxes still exist. We have to update them a little bit, but we do have a lot of wildlife that use our pond. I'll go through that a little bit later. And I just wanted to kind of fast forward um, again, this is 2003. So that swim that I showed you here, that was in 2001 and I continued that for a few years. In 2003, we extended Bradley deck and built an observatory. Um, and this observatory, Tom McKeg donated a telescope and built the observatory. And so we do have open viewing nights. Um, through there's a telescope in here uh, because of COVID, we haven't been able to do them for a few years, but hopefully they will resume in the next, uh, hopefully in the fall. And Krista Syrup does the open viewing nights. And so this observatory was built, um, the Bradley deck was extended. So that was also another um, addition. Here you can see a photo of the observatory and the deck. This is a lot more current. This is, I think, in 2008, this photo. And here you can see we have um, just after a burn. And speaking of that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening now. So 2008, the burns were reestablished. There were a few gaps, a few years of gap, but pretty much from 2008, we've been trying to burn the prairie every other year in the spring. Uh, 2010, a rain garden was installed by Scott Murdoch um, on the east entrance. And then really a huge portion of our prairie restoration began in 2017. Uh, this is when we had a huge eradication of um, buckthorn stand. So buckthorn is an invasive shrub. So if you do ever do any work at uh, other prairies or other um, uh, forest preserves, you'll be doing a lot of buckthorn maintenance. So it needs to be cut and then herbicide applied to kill it because even fire doesn't kill it. So this is what, I just wanted to show you the difference. So this is from that first original photo. I just zoomed in. So here you can see the prairie and you can see how these dark patches, all of these dark patches, that's all buckthorn. So those are shrubs that don't belong because we are trying to maintain this as a tall grass prairie. And if we just let nature do its course, did nothing, then the Eventually what would come in is the shrubs would take over and then eventually trees and it would look just like the forest preserves on the other side. So this is what it looks like now. This picture was taken. This I took this picture in the fall. So all of that buckthorn is gone. Um, so again, you can see before I tried to take a similar angle. All of this buckthorn is gone. So that was a huge, huge major project in 2017, and we got rid of all of that buckthorn. I, there's still little new sprigs of buckthorn. Um, a lot of that is treated by the fire, and then we do um, restoration. So some of the stuff we do now, so from 2018 to the present, um, every other year we burn. We burned the prairie last year, so we're not doing a spring burn this year, but we'll do another spring burn next year. Um, we do large scale eradication of Phragmites. Phragmites is 
Um, you can see it really clearly in this picture here. It looks very pretty. It's an invasive grass and it has a very, very big seed head. Um, and so that became, after we got rid of all of the buckthorn, that was the next big project. We were trying to get rid of this Phragmites and we'll never completely get rid of it, but um, Phragmites is extremely invasive and it will take over the entire ecosystem um, and all of the other native prairies will just basically die off. And it, um, it's been a big problem and we've been working very hard uh, that's what we've been doing in 2018, and that's what we're gonna, we do on the off years, the non-burn years. We treat the Phragmites. Um, we also do annual fall seed collection. So, Nat 111 environmental science class in the fall, students will collect seeds, and then we will refrigerate them mix them with rice hulls and then disperse them in the winter time. So we did that. The students are all part of this and um, they will disperse the seeds. We did that this winter in uh, December, uh, sorry, January. So just about a month ago. And then of course there's year round invasive removal. So we cut buckthorn, students will cut teasel heads. Um, we will apply herbicides. Students don't do that. Um, you have to be certified, but they can cut buckthorn and teasel. And then we also do periodic tours for high school scouts, just and local community members. So we're constantly doing um, lots of tours. I just wanted to show you some photos of our prairie plants. Um, so we have, of course, grasses, but also forbs. This is the iconic prairie grass, uh, tall grass prairie grass, it's called big blue stem. And big blue stem can reach heights of about seven feet tall. And it's also known as turkey foot because it has this little, these little seed heads look like turkey feet. Uh, this is Indian grass or also known as gold stem. That's another iconic uh, prairie grass. So here's a little closer up in bloom so you can see all the beautiful seeds and this is called panic grass or switch grass it, and again you can see the seed heads here this is one of the forbs that we have this is lady slipper this is prairie milkweed so um, wonderful for milkweed uh, for butterflies um, here is blue vervain, another forb. This is called tall coreopsis. Sawtooth sunflower and goldenrod. New England aster. Here you can see prairie comb flower is the yellow and wild bergamot. Another beautiful close up of prairie comb flower. More aster. And this is also an iconic prairie plant. It's called pale purple comb flower, and there's a tiger swallowtail butterfly on top of it. This is also known as echinacea. And then our iconic bur oak tree that we have right beside the pond. Along with the vegetation, there's a myriad of insects. Uh, I don't have photos of all of the insects, but this is um, a beautiful prairie orb spider. So many bird species. Here's a goldfinch, Canada goose, um, mallard duck, and here is a nesting mallard duck in our wonderful wetland habitat that we have. Here's a close up. And I don't, I wish I had photos of all of the, the um, beautiful animals and plants, but you'll just have to come and see the prairie for yourself. And so I just wanted to thank you. Um, I have a quote by Aldo Leopold here. He's also one of my heroes. If you don't know who Aldo Leopold is, you should look him up and read his book, A Sand, Sand County Almanac. So that's it for right now. If anyone has any questions, Troy, I will give it back to you.
All right. Thank you so much, Yana. That's fantastic. And it's great to see like the connections with students and you know the, the staff and faculty that have put in their time. It really is owned by the community, which I think is such it makes it so um, unique. For our audience members, I want to remind everybody that on May 6th at noon, we have a volunteer day scheduled in our nature study area where you can come and actually help us do work. Really, us as in Yana is leading the way, <laughs> um, but we're helping to organize it here in the library um, to spend um, an hour of your time um, helping remove buckthorn and other work that needs to be done. So hopefully we'll have a beautiful uh, spring day. Um, so put that on your calendar. That's May 6th at noon. You can get information on that on the library website. Also, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q and a um, before we, we wrap up here in a few minutes, I guess, Yana, you mentioned a little bit, but I, I'll start out just with a question. Um, what is the most significant threat that we need to worry about? Um, for the prairie, is, is it the invasive species? Is that pretty much it? Yes, that's a good question. It pretty much is the invasive species. Um, we've had, a, as I said, we have a pretty good grasp on the buckthorn. That was a big problem in the 90s. Um, and as you saw in that photo, you know, if it's not being maintained, it would just, it would have just also taken over the prairie. Um, right now, our biggest threat, we we really tackled the buckthorn. Um, and, you know, it takes several years to see the outcome. Um, and we're still constantly doing maintenance on buckthorn, but we eradicated a huge portion of it. And the fire is helping with the small blue, you know, the new shoots. But the biggest problem, yes, is Phragmites. And we are kind of right now finally starting to see some of those results. Um, and we just did a huge treatment of Phragmites in the fall. And we did also a huge reseeding of all of the stuff that we treated because a big chunk of the, the especially up by the pond, wherever it is wet. Um, so all around the perimeter of the pond, Phragmites is, uh, is kind of a wetland plant, but it can also do really well in dry locations. That's what makes it so invasive. And so that's our biggest threat right now. And, and we're trying to get that under control. Until uh, this year, really with the tours you've given of, of the nature study area, I didn't know what Phragmites was. And now that I do, it's everywhere. I can see why it's such a problem because yeah, it's, it's all over the place. You see it time. everywhere. You see it on the roadsides. You, I mean, now you can never unsee it anymore. Yeah, <laughs> it's right. everywhere. And you see how what a big, and another problem is, is teasel. That's a little bit easier to, um, to treat, but yeah, it, you see it everywhere. It's all over. It's kind of the new purple loose strife. Yeah, it's, of it's our area. crazy. Yeah. Yes. So um, there's a question from Ren. Um, where would we be able to find an old growth prairie in Illinois or anywhere really? Are there any left of the original <laughs> that, original? That's prairie? a good question. So what we would call a virgin prairie, the only places you can find tiny remnants of virgin prairies would be in, you know, along railroad tracks, old railroad tracks, maybe old cemeteries. So there's no large scale virgin prairies that exist in, in Illinois. All of the large scale prairies were completely, you know, destroyed and turned into agricultural farmland. And the reason they were turned into agricultural farmland, I know I didn't talk about this, but um, it's because prairie grasses, because of the, the root system, the, um, all of the, you know, <sighs> Just the, the, the prairie soil is one of the most fertile soils in the world. So that is why, you know, it, it was all converted into agricultural farmland. And that's it. Its own, it, its own ecological health brought about its own demise, basically. <laughs> right. That's it's too bad. Yeah. You had mentioned, um, Nat 111, Natural Science 111 as your course. Yes. Seems like a good advertisement if people are interested in, <laughs> yes. in understanding yes. about the prairie. Is, are there any prereqs to that? Is that like open no, for anybody to take? Uh, uh, no, there's no prereqs. It's in it's introduction to environmental science. And we do a lot, especially the fall, because weather is a little bit better. We do a lot of work on the prairie. And that's, as I mentioned, all of the seed collecting that we put down was all collected by students 
and some faculty. Um, so, yes, you mentioned how important it was to see all the students and the community members. And that's what, you know, I started this talk with the fact that um, the prairie was, I'm just a steward at this moment of the prairie, but if it evolved long before me and I hope it will continue on before me and it was all part of, um, you know, all a collaboration with students and faculty. A question from uh, Zoila wants to know if there's any seeds available uh, for us for our backyards. Um, we don't have any seeds right now uh, for purchase or, or to give. Um, there are so many nurseries, though, uh, that you can get, you know, seeds from and I can. I can find if you want to email me, I can give you some examples of nurseries. And I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick shout out. Just there's a community group called SAG Moraine. They actually came and did a talk for us in the fall as part of our programming. Um, they're a nonprofit. They're right here in the, the greater Palos area, and their job is to restore um, wow. prairie plants, really looking to keep um, animal species, insect species healthy, hoping that people plant native prairie plants right. in their backyard. So if you just go to sagmoraine.org, you can okay. get information. They have plant sales, they distribute seeds. And, and like Yana said, there's all over the place. You can also get other plants, but um, they're, they're super nice and they do uh, good work. So I wanted to mention them, so. Thank you. And you know what, that's a great, I know, I, I only really talked about the history of our prairie. I really didn't talk all about what prairies are. Um, that would be a whole nother talk. <laughs> <laughs> that's for next time. We can do that yes, for next time. For next time. All right, well, I don't know. I think that's probably um, all the questions. I just wanna say, Yana, thank you so much, um, not only for this talk, but for all the work you do uh, with, uh, with the Prairie. I, I know I love it when I drive into work every day. I drive right through it and I always appreciate, you know, seeing how it grows and evolves and changes throughout the year. I, I, I sound like such an old timer because I've been doing it for so long. I've, you know, you kind of used to where we are in the year by how the Prairie looks, so. Um, and yes. I, I uh, appreciate all of that. So, oh, well, thank you so much. I, I just noticed. Thank you very much. I just noticed I can't see the chats very well, um, but I did just notice uh, a student of mine, Ren, that's on the <laughs> on and they did help out so much. That class did a lot of seed collecting. So thank you to all of my students for and I always say that to the students that this is, you know, all that you see is your work. It's all the students that came before us and all the students that exist today. So, um, yes, thank you also so much to all the students who have contributed their blood, set, sweat, and tears in all the restoration work. It's so fantastic. Just a quick reminder, Friday, May 6th at noon is that volunteer day. You can come in the library or go to the library website to get information on how to sign up. So with that, we will wrap it up. Thank you so much, Yana. Thank you very much. Thank you.